For years, Northern Ireland has struggled to reform the ways we deal with violence against women and girls. Tonight, as a family, these women step forward to tell their story of abuse at the hands of a man who, in public, commanded respect. Well, how am I? I thought he's going to come and kill me. I lived in fear. All as I could picture was this face over, over the top of me and breathing heavy. The battle to bring him to justice almost broke them. We thought we'd won. Yeah, we won the case, but we lost. And we hear from the former judge who's bringing about radical change. These people who perpetrate these crimes have to be brought to justice. An international rugby star, a loyal Orangeman, and a devoted public servant. David Tweed was a political and physical force. At six foot six, the Balamoney man was a towering public figure, serving as a councillor for the DUP and later the TUV. He was also known as a devoted dad. But what appeared to be the perfect family life, for them, was a living hell. Tonight, for the first time on television, David Tweed's family described the monster behind the man. This is his ex-wife Margaret and her daughters, Amanda, Lorraine, Victoria, and her youngest, Jamie Lee. Their sister Catherine was not available to take part. David Tweed died in a motorbike accident five months ago, prompting public tributes. The family say it was that praise that forced them to reveal the truth. I wasn't until he died, and us taking a stance and turning around and saying, no, you have to realise what type of monster <laughs> you are singing praises about. And that's when we've all sort of just stood together and had enough of it. Margaret had had Amanda and a son from a previous marriage. They lived in Belfast until Margaret met Tweed in the 1980s and they moved to Ballamoney. Amanda was around four at the time. She says it wasn't long before he began beating her mother. There were incidents whenever she was pregnant with Lorraine where he, he had her held against the bathroom door, choking her until my mum passed out when she was pregnant. Um, he had he's left her face in a really bad state where she's had to hide away for weeks until it healed. My mum tried to leave a couple of times and he would threaten then to either hurt us or take us away and or even murder her. He threatened my power of murder as well. You know, I know this man, he's going to come after you with a chainsaw and he's going to, you know, saw your head off. But Lorraine experienced more than scary threats. Like her mum, she too was subjected to Tweed's violent fits of rage. I remember one time coming in from school and it was just over the simplest thing, like... <laughs> we had this, like, spelling test. I was sort of cheating to my mum and, you know, it was like, oh, well, the spelling didn't matter, you know. <laughs> and then I was in the bedroom. But I had actually put my fingers in my ear when Mum was shouting at me. So I did, going, I'm not listening to you. And then he came into the bedroom and he was like screaming at me. And he grabbed my two fingers and he put them in my ears and he was banging my head off the wall. So he was. How old were you? Just primary school. Margaret says she had no choice but to stay in the marriage. You learn to put on a mask as well. You, you can hide everything from everybody. You feel you have to, you know. 
She says the abuse she endured was so bad, she didn't realize just how much of an effect it was having on her children. Until a teenage Amanda wrote a poem about it. I hear her cries, but what am I to do? I'm helpless up here in my room. I just curl up on my bed and squeeze my teddy tight and cover my ears so I don't hear the fight. It was a poem that was a per the perspective of a child and witnessing that from your parent, you know, one of your parents being beaten. Well, it made me realise, you know, the pain the kids were suffering. That really did because I thought, you know, you're so self-absorbed because you're hurting yourself. You don't see the pain you're putting your kids through. And the fact is, you know, they shouldn't even have to go through that. So it was an eye-opener for me, really, a big eye-opener. Margaret's eyes may have been opened to the hurt Tweed's violence was causing her children, but she remained blind to the fact that her husband was a paedophile who was sexually abusing all five girls under their roof. It wasn't until two other women accused Tweed of sexually abusing them as children that Margaret and the rest of the world first got a glimpse of what he truly was. Margaret left Tweed and ordered him out of their home. He went to Amanda to convince her he was innocent, but she knew better. Well, he denied it, straight up denied it. Um, it was like, how are you at my door telling me that you didn't do that to someone else when you've done it to me? Following the allegations against Tweed, Amanda revealed that she too had been abused as a child. My brother looked me dead in the eye and asked me um, had similar happened to me. And um, yeah, I just broke down. She remembers her stepfather abusing her from when she was as young as eight. You know, he would, he would creep into the room at night. Um, and you just never, you just never felt safe, even at home. At night time, you just never, steps. yeah. They had really creaky ankles because of the rugby and you would always hear his ankles hear his cracking and creaking and, you know, it's... He, he would just wake up and he'd just be there, um, looming over you. None of the five sisters knew what the others were experiencing. It wasn't until later in life that a memory came flooding back to Lorraine and she started piecing the jigsaw together. I can remember him crouching over your bed. I, I can remember him leaning over Amanda and I woke up and I was like, you know, what are you doing? And then he came over and, you know, he abused me then too, so. And I can remember him leaving the room and, me saying, no, man, there you are, right? Yeah, I did. And still, neither the two of us had any idea. Like, I thought that it was because I was his, his stepdaughter. I thought it was because I wasn't his blood. I never for a second thought that he would actually do that to his own children. You know, why did... I just don't understand. Like, why did I not just pack these things up with any of my kid and any of my wee, like, sisters or, you know, you, you know. We all lived in fear. You know, yeah. it wasn't our fault. That was drilled into our heads not to be saying nothing. We had to live to protect each other. So we were going to keep our mouths shut. So we just have to be proud that we've all come out and been able to support each other through it. In the trial in 2009, David Tweed was acquitted of the allegations made by the initial two women whose identities remain anonymous. As Amanda and Lorraine find the courage to reveal the horrors they had endured, their close cousin, Gemma Boyd, made her own revelation. She said Tweed had sexually abused her as a child too. All three women reported him to the police. It's terrifying. That was, I was scared. It's like, like who's gonna believe me?
Gemma's allegations went nowhere. For Amanda and Lorraine, it would be a long and harrowing two years before the case would finally make it to court. Well, how am I thought he's going to come and kill me? He's bound to know. He's going to come and kill me. I'd have to fear. I'd have him a blind shot. Lorraine and Amanda had to wait two years to testify against David Tweed. Two years filled with what they describe as fear and apprehension. That experience and others they endured turned out to be far too common among people who report sexual offences. It was the reaction to the high profile rape trial of two rugby internationals in 2018 that started to bring change. Both men were acquitted, but the heightened public attention surrounding their trial raised serious questions about the court process. A review of the handling of sexual offence cases was then undertaken by a former Court of Appeal judge, Sir John Gillen. As a barrister, he prosecuted and defended in serious sexual offence cases, and as a judge, he presided over them. His review made 250 recommendations for change, many of them aimed at reducing the stress placed on alleged victims. I want to throw some light on the criminal justice system, which was, uh, at that stage, I'm afraid, replete with inadequacies so far as serious sexual offences were concerned. If we are going to have uh, a proper protection for women and girls and children in this community, then it is necessary that we all stand up and that complainants come forward and bring these matters before the justice system. Sir John Gillan can't comment on individual cases, so he spoke to Spotlight in general terms about the justice system. But his findings resonate across the Tweed case. For example, one of the inadequacies he found in his review was the inordinate delay faced by complainants in sex offence cases. Delays were egregious. At that stage, back in, when I was doing this in 2018, it's improved since then, but at that stage, the average delay for adults was 943 days. Take a young woman who every morning is waking up with this hanging over her head day after day after day, week after week. And then when she would build herself up for the case, it would be adjourned maybe four or five times. Um, the effect on that was, I think, detrimental to the uh, administration of justice. While Amanda and Lorraine waited and waited for the trial date to approach, their younger sister, Victoria, was coming to terms with her own abuse. Four, five, six, slower. Three more to go. She's had to work hard to protect her mental health from the demons of her past. Four. I love coming to the gym because it's been really good for my mental health. Stress days at work, you know, everything that's went on, you know, with my dad and that there. And if there's any family issues, I sort of come in here and I'm able to train and it just makes me feel a lot better. It is a big release. For years, she blocked out the trauma of her childhood. It wasn't until her late teens that the memories began to surface. Like, I was petrified of the dark because I was always saying the dark shadow was going to come into my room and suffocate me. Like, all as I could picture was this face over, over the top of me and breathing heavy, and I never understood why. And it wasn't until I was around 16, 17 where I started remembering things and the flashbacks and stuff started for me. Victoria says she went through a very dark spell. At the same time, her sisters continued the agonizing wait for their day in court. I had a breakdown at one point in those two years. I used to take panic attacks going into a supermarket or I would drive around to the supermarket and if it was too busy, I would turn and go back home again without groceries. I would have ordered takeaway because it was easier. According to Sir John Gillan, the delay in court proceedings has been a factor in as many as 40% of complainants dropping their case. 
but Amanda and Lorraine persisted, and in November 2012, they finally faced their abuser. They say their cross-examination, having their evidence questioned by the defence, was one of the hardest parts of the trial. A second alleged victim was in a highly distressed state during her evidence. When I was first walking into the courtroom, I collapsed at the doors. I wasn't going to go in. You may be like a grown woman, but I didn't feel like that. She sobbed repeatedly as she outlined a catalogue of alleged abuse, which she said happened in a house, in a car, and at a barn. I felt like that child. You're reliving everything. And you feel like that way, girl, and you feel closed off, you feel your body tense, and you feel, you feel sick. You know, it's, it is horrendous. This is part of the process Sir John Gillen is hoping to change by introducing pre-recorded cross-examination. Cross-examination in the major courts is a very daunting experience. There is the, uh, is the family of the accused, maybe even the accused friends, eyeballing you and so on. We now have two pilot schemes of remote evidence centres. You will be um, beamed through by a video into the court building. You will have all the trauma and the fears of meeting um, the accused and his family and so on, all removed. The Tweed sisters wanted their day in court, but when it came to giving their evidence, they say they faced a much longer grilling than the accused. I was in and out of the court every day for the first week, and I believe he was only in for a couple of hours. I felt as if I was being interrogated. Do you know, I felt as if I had done something wrong um, in, the, the, in the way that I was being questioned, the way that I was spoken with, the tone that was being used by, by his barrister. Sir John Gillen has called for more training of barristers and judges to avoid, as he calls it, rancorous exchange. But he warned it would never be a pleasant experience for the alleged victim or complainant. This is not a party game. There has to be an adversarial system where the accused is entitled to uh, have his case put firmly and robustly to the um, uh, complainant. But we can do steps to ameliorate the difficulties that complainants uh, experience to some extent. For the sisters, simply navigating the court system was a minefield. We didn't have anybody to walk us through the, the case. We didn't have anybody to walk us through our statements. We didn't have anybody to walk us through how we would be questioned by them, never mind um, the defence team. We literally were going in blind. This is an area where the Gillen Review has since made significant strides, offering legal advice for complainants. In serious sexual offence cases, the accused has a barrister to represent them, but the complainant is considered a witness to the state and has had no legal advice. For the first time in these islands, you will have access to a legal advisor and they will explain to you what the legal rights are in terms of disclosure, the right of the other side to explore your previous sexual history. They'll explain to you what's going to be involved in the, in the system and the process that's going to happen. Uh, that has empowered complainants. No longer is the system going to be just a mystery to them. In 2012, David Tweed was convicted of sexually abusing his daughter and stepdaughter. Their cousin Gemma Boyd's evidence wasn't used in Tweed's trial. They had told her that her evidence wasn't strong enough to take it to court. It, it did really affect her massively. It yeah. devastated her. She has always come from a place of feeling like she wasn't believed. Even though we believed her, you know, and, and we knew, and she knew that we believed her. You know, she needed, she needed more, she needed to be heard properly. Days before Tweed was sentenced in 2013, his 20-year-old niece took her own life. Rarely can anyone be sure what drives a person to suicide. But Amanda thinks if Gemma had had more support, 
she might still be alive. I believe her memories were jumbled and, and she wasn't able to make a clear picture yet, but maybe if she had had the right support to help her piece that picture together and give, give good, strong evidence, then yeah, maybe she would still be here. We thought we'd won. <laughs> We want the case, but we must. <laughs>David Tweed was sentenced to serve four years in prison and four years on license. Just before his release, he successfully appealed his convictions. They were quashed because the Court of Appeal found that the jury at the original trial should not have been told about Tweed's domestic violence. It was a shock. Like, I'm sitting on a bus, a very public place on the way home from my work, and I hear that my abuser has just been released. I found out from someone else who had seen it on the TV. The sisters say no one from the police or the courts had informed them. As Tweed had already served four years, he didn't face an automatic retrial. We understand that after consulting with the victims, the PPS decided not to seek one, much to the relief of Amanda and Lorraine. Emotionally, mentally, I was not in a place that I could have carried myself through another court case at that time. I couldn't have faced them again, but we tried our best. Um, you know, we thought we did succeed. Sir John Gillen was one of the judges who granted Tweed's appeal. He can't comment on cases over which he has presided. His focus is on making the justice system fairer and more compassionate through his review. Since Tweed's release in 2016, the sisters have worked hard to heal, not just from the sexual and physical abuse, but from grief over their cousin's death too. Up to the moment he died in a motorbike accident in October, Tweed denied being an abuser. When David Tweed died, some former DUP and TUV colleagues paid tribute to him, but they later apologized after the Tweed sisters waived their legal right to anonymity and spoke out about their abuse. They say they had found those tributes distressing. I didn't want him going down as this good figure that everybody was making out, you know what I mean? They needed to know the truth, and how are they going to know the truth unless it comes from us directly? The sisters first spoke to the Sunday World newspaper. That's what, I think that's what drives any of us. Mm. Do you know, we can use our experiences to be able to, to encourage other people to speak out, to tell their stories, whether they speak to the police or just get the help that they need to process what they've been through. It's great, great. The scars run deep. Each woman continues to face her own battle. For Amanda, taking back control of her body through tattoos is part of overcoming that trauma. Do you have many tattoos? Yeah, a few, I have. <laughs> you know what it's like once you get one. As the eldest, Amanda carries a huge amount of guilt for not realising that Tweed was abusing her sisters. Tattoo pain's that kind of pain that you forget, isn't it? I thought that I would pick it up. I thought that I would see it, and I didn't. I didn't see it in any of them. We all thought we were protecting each other. Mm -hmm. We all thought that we were protecting our mum. All the while, we were just protecting him. <sighs> our silence protected him. Protecting their mum is still a priority for the sisters, including more recently when comments were directed at Margaret on social media, claiming she didn't do enough to look after her daughters. Despite everything these women have been through, their bond is stronger than ever. People will be pointing out fingers and stuff like that, but you know, she's been through as, just as much as we have, if not, you know, worse, but, you know, thanks to my mum, she's actually been there and she's been the rock between, you know, for us all. So she has, she actually has been 
there to support us, like even through the court yeah. case and stuff. You know, like, and there is parents out there who don't believe their kids and stuff like that. Mum never once didn't doubt any of us. You bring kids into the world to protect them. You don't bring them in to let them be abused the way they were. But I didn't know. I didn't know anything at all. At 22, Jamie Lee is the youngest of the five sisters. She's battled a range of medical conditions throughout her life, and the family is particularly protective of her. She too is a fierce defender of her mum. My mum is my rock. I just have so much respect for her. If she hadn't been here, I would have been gone too. She's supported me through hell and with all my medical conditions too. Strong woman for one Amanda's woman. Amanda's a like. strong one too. These are all strong, every single one of them. I'm just surprised. I'm not talking about her. <laughs> <laughs> so what's next then? Onward and upward. Make yeah. more memories and good memories. We are very fortunate that we've had each other to rely on and and to to lean on at times whenever we've been struggling. It can only get better. Do you know, we can only grow stronger as each day passes. But for many who have survived sexual abuse and are thinking of coming forward, it's critical to have a justice system that works. Last year, 608 people were reported for or charged with rape. In the same year, only eight were convicted. So let me not walk away from it. The, the conviction rate is low. And you get young women saying, well, what on earth is the point of going through this system? Why would I go through it if the chances of conviction are so low? Well, I, I'm anxious to disabuse them of that. Uh, those figures are they're not as low as, as, as seems the position. Sir John Gillen says the delay between reporting and getting to court skews those figures, as does the fact that often the charge of rape is reduced to a lower sexual offence. He believes, however, that things need to be different. Things are going to change, and that's why I more than ever encourage now those who feel they are victims of serious sexual offences to go to the police. These people who perpetrate these crimes have to be brought to justice. It doesn't happen if you, if you uh, step aside. Almost two years into a five-year implementation programme, around 30% of Sir John Gillan's recommendations have been completed. The Department of Justice says the majority are nearly there. The latest measures include the radical step to exclude members of the public from the courtroom in serious sexual offence cases. Legislation to support this forms part of Justice Minister Naomi Long's bill on sexual offences, which progressed through its final stage at the Assembly today. There is still a long way to go but it seems the system is at least one step closer to becoming a more compassionate one for victims.